have um, asked questions about the uh, online class that I teach on uh, Saturdays, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, what they didn't teach you in school. So we deal with thousands of years of history, and we deal with what leads up to uh, the transatlantic slave trade taking place. When we study our history, we can't start our history in slavery. And this is uh, one of the things that really has to be impressed during Black History Month, African American History Month. We can't start our history in slavery. We have to deal with thousands of years of history that leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. We have to deal with ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt, uh, Nubia, ta de deal with these uh, African civilizations, deal with Carthage and um, uh, deal with uh, Zimbabwe and different things like this. OK, and what, what we do in, in this class and there's over 200 slides in the class, um, uh, we go through and look at this history chronologically. There's a timeline of history that we use and then we go through and look at different periods of history to to see cause and effect and we, we look at um, how really Africans lose control. We look at invasions that take place. Um, one, of those, one of those things we look at are the Punic Wars. And uh, we look at Hannibal Barca and the Battle of Canaan, 216 BC. But we um, have to understand that uh, even when we look here at the at the U.S., we have to understand that uh, African people have been in the land we call the United States of America, the, this landmass. We've been here at least 51,700 years. And if we look at Dr. David M. Hotel's book, The First Americans Where Africans Documented Evidence, on page 14 of his book, he deals with a discovery made by Dr. Albert Goodyear in uh, Allendale County, South Carolina in 2004 where they found 13 different types of evidence that to uh, thoroughly document an African presence in the land we call the United States of America go dating back at least 51,700 years ago. Now this is, uh, and in South America dating back at least 56,000 years ago. And they found artifacts, architecture, campsites, carvings, Egyptian writings, footprints, and lava, genetic M174, the haploid groups, the haploid groups dealing with DNA and genetics, linguistics, painting, skull, skeleton structures, and tools. Now, these were the Khoisan. The Khoisan have the oldest DNA on the planet. This is uh, Dr. Albert Goodyear, uh, who's an archaeologist at the University of South Carolina. This is an article from 2004 uh, from ScienceDaily.com that talks about his discovery. This article is almost 20 years old. New evidence puts man in North America 50,000 years ago. Because one of the things we do in the class is we look at archaeological discoveries. And these archaeological discoveries that have come out in the past, uh, within the past 10 years, that are causing the archaeologists and scientists to totally rethink everything and push the timelines back. Okay, so this, this is why we, we can't start our history in this country uh, with us conquered and shackled and changed and conquered by Europeans, all right? But even when, when, even when we deal with our history before the United States, we can't start our history in 1441 with the Portuguese going into Mauritania. We can't start our history in slavery. We have to deal with when African people ruled the world. So the, the Khoisan have the oldest DNA on the planet. An October 2012 genetic study published in Science Magazine found that the Khoisan in Southern Africa are the oldest ethnic group of modern humans with their ancestral line originating about 100,000 years ago. The Khoisan, formerly called by the derogatory term Bushmen, are genetically unique and no other currently known population had separated so early from our common modern human ancestor, according to the report. The Khoisan live mainly in Southern Africa in territory spanning Botswana, Namibia, Angola, Zambia, Zimbabwe, and South Africa. They are largely divided into two groups, hunters and gatherers, the Sans, the Sans people, S-A-N, that's the Sans people, 
and keepers of livestock, the Khoi Khoi people, the Khoi Khoi people, the Khoi San languages include the distinctive click sounds that aren't found in the languages of their neighbors. Now, AtlantaBlackStar.com has a good article called uh, Five Ethnic Groups That Prove the First Humans Were Black. OK, and then we have the people of the uh, Adam and Islands as well. Um, there's a um, so there's a number of different archaeological discoveries that we look at that will totally blow your mind. And they're causing the archaeologists and paleontologists and scientists to understand that all of this is much older than we thought. And they have to keep pushing the timelines back. I mean, there was an ancient beer factory discovered. Uh, it was discovered last year. It was discovered in 2021 in Egypt that dates back 5,000 years. But this discovery right here, um, New York Times is an article from February 2010. On Crete, new evidence of very ancient mariners. On Crete, new evidence of very ancient mariners. And, and this discovery deals with on the Greek island of Crete, which has been an island for more than 5 million years. They found stone tools that date back at least 130,000 years ago. They found stone tools that date back at least 100 and 30,000 years ago. And they said this is looked at as um, evidence because um, it's considered strong, strong evidence for the earliest known seafaring in the Mediterranean. Now, Crete has been an island for more than 5 million years, meaning that the tool makers must have arrived by boat. You're talking about 130,000 years ago, okay? And one of the things Dr. David M. Hotep deals with is how we were sailing 130,000 years ago. So this seems to push the history of Mediterranean voyaging back more than 100,000 years, specialists in Stone Age archaeology say. Previous artifact discoveries has shown people reaching Cyprus a few other Greek islands and possibly Sardinia no earlier than 10 to 12,000 years ago. So this is causing them to have to rethink everything. Okay. You have the lost city of Egypt, Tanis Heraklion, which uh, what they found was revealed in 2013. This was a, uh, a city in Egypt built about eighth century BC or BCE before the common era. And it was swallowed into the sea. It, it was, it, it was swallowed into the sea about 1200 years ago. Okay. Thomas Heraklion. And they found, um, 16 foot tall statues. They found 64 ships. Okay. Uh, at the bottom of the sea, this is what, the, this is what they found, but they found all this evidence of this lost city of Egypt, Thomas Heraklion. They found 700 anchors, countless gold coins. This discovery was revealed in 2013. So I remember when it was revealed, I talked about it uh, when it came out, okay? All right, now, when we look at the, the Washington Monument, that is a ancient African symbol called a Tekken, which comes from the mythology of Asar, Aset, and Heru, who the Greeks called Osiris, Isis, and Horus. And there were about 1,200 Tekkenu all throughout ancient Kemet. We know that the uh, foundation of Freemasonry comes out of ancient Kemet as well, comes out of the teaching from the lodges, the mystery systems out of ancient Kemet. And 50 of the 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence were Freemasons. Uh, Egypt, so there's some books that we reference in the class, you don't have to buy any of the, any of the books to follow, follow along. But one of them is Egypt on the Potomac by Tony Browder. And I've interviewed, Browder's a friend of mine, I've interviewed him a number of times. Brilliant historian and archaeologist. There were approximately 1,200 Tekkenu built in ancient times 
but only about a dozen are found in e only about a dozen are found in Egypt today. Many of the Tekkenu removed from Egypt are now in Istanbul, Turkey, uh, London, uh, England, Paris, France, Berlin, Germany, Vatican City in Italy, uh, Rome, Italy, Vatican City, and elsewhere throughout the world. The Tekkenu, Tekkenu for plural, are now called obelisks by their new owners and few know their origin or that they symbolize the resurrection of the African king Asar or the, the African king Asar from the mythology of Asar set Heru. Now, the word Mason is derived from the Latin words mass and sun. Mason means child of light and expresses the desire to pursue light which is a metaphor for the sun, which symbolizes knowledge. So for, you know, for eons, light has been associated with knowledge. And even when you watch, say, cartoons, and a cartoon character has an idea, you may see a light bulb go off over the cartoon character's head, associating light with knowledge. And darkness has been associated with ignorance or lack of knowledge. So when Europe is cast into the dark ages, after the Vandals and the Visigoths crushed the western portion of the Roman Empire in 476 AD, this is a period of ignorance. And it's going to be the teachings that the Moors taken to Europe, coming from the Nile Valley region of Africa, the, 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 the knowledge coming from the Nile Valley region of Africa, the, the African Moors are taking the light from Africa into the dark continent, Europe. And this knowledge brings Europe out of the dark ages. Okay, it brings them out of the dark ages, late 1400s. And then they go into the next age, like early 1500s, they go into the next age, which is the Renaissance age which is a period of enlightenment, light in reference to knowledge. The Renaissance age, a period of enlightenment. The term child of light or sons and daughters of light was first used to identify um, students who had completed 42 years of study in the temples of ancient Kemet. Many Masonic temples were modeled after the temples of Kemet, places where light or knowledge was imparted in a series of steps or degrees. So George G.M. James talks about this in, in Stolen Legacy. The concept of uh, liberal arts colleges comes out of ancient Kemet, comes out of ancient Africa. And uh, he taught in Stolen Legacy, he talks about the seven liberal arts the arithmetic and the rhetoric and the logic logic different different things like this and the concept of going to an institution of higher learning and getting your credentials in a series of steps or degrees comes out of ancient africa so associate's degree bachelor's degree master's degree philosophy degree phd etc these are, these, these are ancient concepts. Okay. Um, so Masonic temples are considered houses of light or temples of learning. The term Mason, child of light, is, is a direct reference to the highest degree of the comedic education system. Okay. The 33 degrees of instruction within Freemasonry represent a fraction of the 360 degrees of instruction that comprise the comedic system of education. Yet with less than 10% of the wisdom of ancient Kemet, of ancient Africa, Freemasons have held positions of influence and power throughout the world for over 200 years. Read page 33 of uh, Egypt on a Potomac by Tony Browder. Okay, so there's a ton of information that we deal with. We deal with things like 
who was St. Nicholas, because we go through and look at thousands of years of history. And we go through this history chronologically. We deal with some of the history of the Moors and going into the Iberian Peninsula, which is today known as Spain and Portugal, 711 AD. We look at some different African, civiliz Afri African civilizations, Ghana, Songhai, and Mali, and Zimbabwe, and Carthage, and uh, uh, Nubia, and, and Abyssinia, Ethiopia. But when we look at St. Saint Nicholas, first of all, a lot of the early Christian saints were African saints. A lot, of, a lot of early Christian saints were Africans. And early Christianity looks a lot like traditional African spiritual systems. A lot of early Christians believed in some sort of reincarnation. Uh, so if you read uh, uh, Christianity Before Christ by Dr. John G. Jackson, he breaks down a lot of this in the book. Okay, now how's everybody doing? Okay, you're still there, you're still awake. Okay, give me a thumbs up, give me a heart, give me a like. How do you like this type of information? These are some of the slides from the class. We have over 200 slides in the class. All these slides I put together myself. I've been teaching this class since 2017, but it has grown immensely since I first taught it in 2017. Uh, and if you've taken any of my online classes in the past, be sure to email me at ahnshow at africanhistorynetwork.com because you'll get 50% off uh, these classes. So this um, class here, this one meets on Saturdays, uh, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So we do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. You can go back and watch it anytime. In class, you can see me. I can't see you. Um, you know, I don't take attendance, anything like that. All right. Uh, this is ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Uh, the, the term Ma'afa is a Kiswahili term, which refers to, uh, the great disaster. It refers to our Holocaust. Okay. Which is totally different than anybody else's. This is not trying to um, take away from um, other disasters that have happened to other people, but ours is entirely different, all right? And um, so this is a, a, you can use this information with your children also. I would say the information is PG-13. The, uh, the other class that I teach is, so this class is on sale $60, regularly $130. And after you, there's also a bonus content that you get as well. So there's 15 bonus lectures that you'll get from me that make up the uh, Michael M. Hotel 15 uh, lecture bundle pack. We have it in DVD format, the uh, 15 DVD bundle pack, but you're going to get it in digital format when you register for this class. Okay. You get 15 of my lectures that are included in this bundle pack also. In the second class I teach on Sunday, is from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement of Black Power, 1865 to 1968. That's on sale, $60 also, regularly $130. And that's 2 p.m. to 4 p.m., same format. Um, and we have them, both classes in the bundle pack for only $100, regularly $260, okay? All right, so uh, we posted the link here and it's at our website, africanhistorynetwork.com. If you have any questions, be sure to email me at ahnshow at africanhistorynetwork.com. If you want me to do a, a, a modified class for your church, for your study group, your organization, your fraternity, sorority, et cetera, email me as well. We can set that up. So when we deal with St. Nicholas, St. Nicholas, um, you know, this, this intersects with center class, um, that, which is Dutch for uh, St. Nicholas. And the uh, religious figure center class that we see um, that we see um, worshipped in um, uh, the Netherlands and Holland, things like this. And then this also gets into Black Pete, Joie de Piet, who um, is a Moor, Black Pete the Moor. Um, and you have these Europeans who have a parade and celebrate Joie de Piet and Black Pete. And they put on uh, blackface and Afro wigs, okay? And they, um, 
this right here. They put on blackface and Afro wigs. All right. And they celebrate the coming of center class and black Pete. Now from center class, from this religious figure of center class, you get the secular figure, the mythological figure of Santa Claus. Okay. And center class is introduced into the U S in the early 1700s by the Dutch. And you're going to have the cartoonist Thomas Nast, the cartoonist Thomas Nast, N-A-S-T, is, is largely credited with creating the uh, secular figure of Santa Claus, the jolly fellow, fat, red and white suit, things like this. But that comes from center class, which comes from uh, the Netherlands. But if we look at uh, Bishop Nicholas of uh, Myra, which is modern day Turkey, he was a Greek Orthodox bishop born in uh, 280 AD. He was African, by the way, as well, as many of your early saints were. He was born to wealthy parents and gave away his inheritance to the poor. He's a patron saint to children, seamen, prostitutes, palm brokers. Uh, and patron saints are saints who are said to watch over group, different groups of people. These are patron saints. And th the concept of the patron saints is going to come from the Netaru. Because when you study, when you study the Netaru um, coming uh, out of ancient Kemet, and you have like Ma'at and Aset. Aset is associated with uh, love and fertility. Uh, Aset, the mother of Heru. And we know that um, this is where you get the uh, the first Holy Trinity of Asar, Aset, and Heru. Heru born of a virgin birth, December 25th, which ties into astronomy. All right. And you deal with, I've done a whole presentation dealing with the winter solstice and uh, why Christmas is celebrated on December 25th. We deal with that in the class as well. There's a whole separate lecture I've done dealing with that in uh, ancient Kemet, the winter solstice and the history of Christmas. But uh, Christ is not a name, it's a title We're dealing with anointed or the anointed one. Uh, Christ coming from the Greek Christos, coming from the Kemetic Ka rest, Ka rest, Ka meaning spirit, rest meaning to rise. When you study all this, it takes you right back to ancient Africa or Sumer or Mesopotamia. And we're dealing with a retelling of ancient stories. We're dealing with a retelling of ancient stories told over and over again adapted to various people's cultures cultures throughout thousands of years okay and their ethnicity is put on and their names are put on it in their uh their their, their ideology that coming from their culture their, their mores their cultures things like this are infused into these stories when you look at in europe they were worshiping the black madonna and child even before the moors go into europe which comes from Asar, Aset, and heru but you still have statues of the black Madonna and child in Europe right now in, in, in uh, France, in Spain, in Portugal, Germany, Czechoslovakia, Russia. And from the black Madonna and child, you get the decolorized version of the white Mary and Jesus. And as Europeans are coming out of the dark ages and they start conquering other people's lands and extracting the wealth out of people's lands, extracting the mineral wealth and building up Europe because Europe had been devastated by the uh, black death, the bubonic plague and from 1347 to 1400, Europe loses between a quarter to a third of their population. But as you see a rise in European powers, you're gonna see a rise in the Europe, in the dominance of the European phenotype. The European the phenotype gets elevated and a lot of these different figures that were traditionally African figures, mythological, et cetera, get reinterpreted as European. When you study Zeus amongst the Greeks, in Greek mythology, Zeus, in, in Greek mythology, they tell you Zeus comes from Ethiopia. We know the word 
Ethiopia and Ethiops is Greek, which means sunburnt. But they tell you uh, Zeus comes from Ethiopia. Originally, Hercules was black. When you when you uh, then you're going to see um, Michelangelo paint the Sistine Chapel. And he uses his aunt and uncle as the models for Adam and Eve. You're going to you're going to see this reinterpretation of these traditional figures that were traditionally African. You're going to see them reinterpreted as European. And then they're going to be projected around the world. If you look at this book here. This is one. This is one of the books I use in the class from uh, Renoko Rashidi, who is a friend of mine. We know Renoko passed away August second, twenty twenty one. He was in Egypt. Black Star: The African Presence in Early Europe. Black Star: The African Presence in Early Europe. So on page ninety, and you know Renoko had a library of probably about forty thousand photographs he took. He visited uh, something like one hundred twenty five islands and countries all around the world. And he would document the African presence all around the world. So these are statues of the Black Madonna and Child in Switzerland, uh, Poland, Madrid, Spain, Luxembourg, city Luxembourg. They were basically worshiping African people. This is coat of arms of Pope Benedict the Sixteenth with the head of a Moorish king because when you when you study a lot of these Europeans bloodlines they have African Moors in their bloodlines because the Moors intermix into European populations okay so on a lot of uh, a lot of the the uh, royalty in these different European nations on their coat of arms they have an African Moors head because they had some Moorish ancestry in their bloodline this right here is the uh the flag of Sardinia, the national flag of Sardinia that has four Moors heads on it. That's the national flag right now. Originally, the originally the bandana was a blindfold because the Moors were in those areas, but they were conquered. And we're going to see in different areas like the Moors conquered and enslaved, and we see this especially amongst the Spanish. Okay, and they're going to be taken into different uh, like Spanish colonies. But this is a deep history. Um, we look here. You see uh, the Black Madonna and Child here in France. You see it, uh, uh, another Black Virgin of Paris. We see one here in uh, Spain. Another one in uh, Kremlin in Moscow. This painting, that's in Moscow. This is page 89. Okay, so this all ties into our history. This is a deep book right here. I interviewed Renoko about this book in 2014. This is another book we use in the class, Golden Age of the Moor, edited by Dr. Ivan Van Sertema. Because this, we, we go through and deal with this history chronologically. Okay, so Golden Age of the Moor is another book we deal we use. Uh, Before the Mayflower by Lerone Bennett Jr. is one that we use. Okay, this is the sixth edition. It's beat up. I need another one. Now that the contributions of civilization by Tony Browder is one. How white folks got so rich, the untold story of American white supremacy. This is the third edition from the Nation of Islam Research Group. The Egyptian philosophers, ancient African voices from Imhotep to Akhenaten by Dr. Malefe Keti Asante. Now, you don't have to buy any of these books to follow along in class. I use these for reference. We cite different parts of the book. This right here, the Declaration of Independence and other great documents of American history. I use more so in the uh, second class I teach uh, from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. This one right here, this is probably about $2 uh, from Dover Books. This is a really good one. It has Declaration of Independence, U.S. Constitution, all that stuff in there. But you can read the U.S. Constitution at um, LOC.gov, Library of Congress website. OK, you can read it for free there. Because we understood the Constitution, we'd be much better off. We understood history and law. This one right here, Collective Courage, a history of African-American cooperative economic uh, 
thought and practice by that Dr. Jessica Gordon M. Hart, which deals with our deep, rich histories, uh, a deep, rich history of cooperative economics and the co-ops. This is another book that that we reference in the class. OK, now Valley Contributions to Civilization by Tony Browder. Egypt on the Potomac by Browder as well. This book right here, Egypt on the Potomac. Christmas Miscellany, Everything You Always Wanted to Know About Christmas by Jonathan Green. This is one of the books I, I, I read when I was really studying the history and origins of Christmas. Because I've been uh, doing presentations dealing with the history of Christmas going back to 2012. So those are just a few of the books that we do within the class. So you don't have to, some of these books you may have in your library. If you don't, it's fine. You, you still be able to follow along in the class. I have a lot of slides for you. The, all these slides I put together myself. How's everybody doing? Okay. How you all like this type of information? Who still needs to register for this uh, 10 week online class? As soon as you register, you can watch the class we did last week. I'll post the link here again. And we also have a bundle pack when you register for both classes for only $100. Classes are regularly $130 each. We have a, a special discount right now. If you have any questions, if you have to make any other arrangements, if you want to pay through PayPal or anything like that, I mean, or pay through Cash App, email me AHN show at African History Network dot com. AHN show at African History Network dot com. All right, let's continue here. We'll be here for a few more minutes. So um, it's important to understand uh, this history chronologically. Historical events don't happen in a vacuum. They are the culmination of a sequence of historical events that lead to other events taking place. Uh, some other things we deal with now, we deal with um, the film Black Panther. And the film Black Panther is deep on multiple levels. OK. Um, the word Wakanda is a real word. There were 11 different African cultures infused into the film Black Panther. Uh, Ruth Carter, who was the costume designer, she did, she studied 11 different African cultures over the course of um, studied 11 different African cultures over the course of uh, about six months. And you see this incorporated into the film. Now, Bast is short for Bastet, is a deity or netter from ancient Kemet. The, the panther deity Bast that watches over the people of Wakanda and Wakanda is not one group of people. Wakanda is the nation. Wakanda is made up of 18 different tribes. Okay. Cause I had to do, I, I, I do lectures dealing with the film black Panther. And I did about three months research on the film and the comic book to understand what the hell I was seeing in the movie before I went out here and started talking about it and doing lectures. Okay. Other people didn't do that. I'm not going to call any names, but I can listen to them and tell they ain't do any research. And two of the books that I read, first of all, there's about 100 articles that I read dealing with the movie and the comic book to do because I'm a researcher to really understand what I'm seeing on the screen. And the movie Black Panther was the 18th film in the Marvel comic universe. And all those films have an interconnected storyline. And then there were four other films in that sequence, in that interconnected storyline. So you have to understand the, the interconnection between the movies to understand what you're seeing in the movie. These are, these are two books that I read on the film Black Panther to understand what it is that I'm seeing in the movie before I go out here and start talking about it and doing presentations across the country. Um, the official movie special black panther so this has interviews with the cast the director ryan coogler background information on the movie things like this right how many people have seen this book how many people have seen this book i read a hundred different over a hundred articles on the on the movie black panther okay to understand what i'm seeing in the movie and then I read this book here by Marvel, also by Marvel, 
Black Panther, the ultimate guide. This deals with the 52 year history of the Black Panther comic book, because a lot of the. A lot of the things from the comic book we see in the movie. And then we see changes in the storylines, things like this. So I had to I had to study the, the Dora Malaji comes straight out the comic book. I had to study the history of the comic book to understand what I'm seeing in the movie before I go out here and start doing presentations on the movie. And understanding like the change in the storyline of Killmonger, things like this. Because in the comic book, Killmonger is 100% Wakandan. He's not half Wakandan, and half African-American. And look at the introduction of um, uh, Black Panther in um, uh, the Fantastic Four uh, comic book. All this stuff, okay? So when we look at Wakanda, first of all, Wakanda is a real word. Wakanda means uh, possesses secret powers in the uh, Omaha Ponca Native American language and the Sioux Indian language. And then uh, Wakanda is also a Bantu word as well. Now, when we look at Bast or Bastet, Bastet is an ancient Egyptian goddess or netter worshipped in the form of a cat or a, in the form of a lioness and later a cat. She's a goddess of warfare and lower Kemet worshipped as early as the second dynasty about 2890 BCE before the common era. When we look at the Black Panther comic book, Wakandan religion and its tribes the religion of the Wakandan people first developed during the pilgrimage to the land in their conflict with the originators. The gods of Wakanda formed from the heroes of humans within the tribe. Ascending to the status of a god, these heroes became the Orisha. The Orisha are the names of the deities in the spiritual system of Ifa, which is practiced amongst the Yoruba of Nigeria. This is in the comic book, the Orisha. Some people say Orishas, but a brother from Nigeria told me, he said, he said it's Orishas. Ascending to the status of a god, these heroes became the Orisha, taking the names Koku, Thoth, T-H-O-T-H, -T -H, Thoth is what the Greeks call Dahuti. Dahuti is the uh, deity, the netter, that delivered the Annunciation to the virgin Aset that she's going to give birth to Heru. It's called the Annunciation. That's Dahuti. Bast comes from Bastet, Mujaji, Pata. Pata is one of the, uh, Pata is one of the original Netaru, okay? Pata is one of the original Netaru, it was right behind me, picture of Pata. This is in the Black Panther comic book. And Niami, the Orishas, the Orishas origin, let me flip back over to this, hold on. The Orisha's origin Okay, I'm going to go back to that slide Hold on, why can't I see this here? Alright, here we go Should be able to see it now The Orisha's origins Date back to the ancient Egyptian beings Known as the Ennead So, if you If you study ancient Kemet, you know the Ennead refers to the nine original Netaru. This is straight, this is out of the Black Panther comic book. What are the Ennead? Ennead means group of nine in Greek. In ancient Kemet, they were called Pesjet. The nine Netaru were Atom, which is the sun, 
Shu, which is air, tough nut, moisture, geb, earth, and nut, sky, Osar, who the Greeks called Osiris, Oset, Isis, Seth, Set, who was the brother of Osar, and Nephetus. This, this is known as the Ennead, which comes straight out of ancient Kemet, but that's in the Black Panther comic book. Read pages 274 and 277 of Ancient Egypt by uh, Lorna Oaks and Lucia Galen. Also now Valley Contributions to Civilization. And they, they break this down in the book because pages 274 to 277, they have a, um, they have a chart of the Netaru. This book right here. They have a chart of the Netaru. And so we show you this in the class. We go through and break all this stuff down and put it into or like organize all the information. They have a chart of the of the deities of the Netaru and their attributes. And from the Netaru, this is where we get the concept of the saints. Because in Christianity, and contrary to popular belief, the Catholic Church wasn't founded until mid 11th century AD. It's going to be the Eastern Orthodox Church that we see early on. So when you had a Council of Nicaea in 325, it's not, that's not the Catholic Church. Catholic Church is not founded until centuries later. That's the Eastern Orthodox Church. That's the Eastern Orthodox Church that we see when in 431 uh, or 432 AD, Pope Celestine I sends a, a British slave named Patrick into Ireland to convert the Irish to uh, Christianity. C Catholicism doesn't exist. And he's fighting against the Druids and killing the Druids. This is how we get the myth of St. Patrick. And they say he drove the snakes out of Ireland, but the but the but the uh, the Druids are dealing with a watered down version of the teachings coming out of ancient Kemet. And uh, they wore on their helmets, they wore a uh, cobra or they have a Uraeus on their helmets and they were known as the snake people. We also deal with things like the, because uh, we, we we deal with the um, Crusades, starting at about 1096 AD, 1095, 1096 AD, the Crusades. And um, we know during the Second Crusade, you have the uh, Knights Templar formed in 1118 AD. Knights Templar, the Knights Templar are dealing, they're learning from the Moors and they become very powerful and the Knights Templar in France, they're going to be uh, disbanded October 13th, 1307. And we deal with this whole thing called Friga Triska Decophobia, which is the fear of Friday the 13th, and Triska Decophobia, which is the fear of the number 13. And there's history behind it, and part of that deals with the, the, uh, the, the Knights Templar, Friday the 13th, uh, 1307. Uh, losing power. But the, but the teachings of the Knights Templar go underground and they resurface as the uh, uh, Freemasons and Rosicrucian, Rosicrucians and these different other secret societies or societies with secrets. But these are watered down versions of the teachings that the Moors taken to Europe that come from ancient Africa. Uh, so this is just, a, just a, a sample of the type of information that we deal with. Um, in Wisconsin, there's a, there's a water park called Wakanda because Wakanda is an ancient term. You have a school, you have a school in Nebraska named Wakanda. You have a water park in Wisconsin named Wakanda. Cause I did, I did a lot of research on this, right? So, um, you'll see some different spellings of the name Wakanda. But Wakanda is the great creator power of the Osaji, Omaha, and Ponca Native American tribes. But we know the first Americans were Africans when we actually study this history and this chronology of this history. 
just takes us back, takes us back to Dr. David Imhotep's book, The First Americans Were Africans Documented Evidence. Wakanda is an abstract, omnipresent, creative force who is never personified in traditional Suan legends and in fact did not even have a gender before the introduction of English with its gender-specific nouns. You can check out native-language.org for more information, but there's other information out there on Wakanda, which is an ancient term. Located in Wakanda Park in Mimini, Wisconsin, on the shore of Lake Miminin, Mimin, Minomin, this group is what's left of once large cluster of mounds. That were submerged when Lake Minoman was created by damming Red Cedar River. Out of 17 submerged mounds, 14 were excavated by archaeologists. Some of the mounds contained burials, including an individual wearing clay mask, the feature found in only two other mound sites in Wisconsin. By different accounts, either three or four miles are still extant in the park, all supposed to be ovals. I found two definite miles in decent condition, unmowed and away from pedestrian traffic at the dead end of the ridge overlooking the lake. Nearby, there was a raise in the ground that might have been a third mound, but it's pretty low and mowed with the rest of the disc golf course on which it's located. Okay, you check out Wisconsin Mounds dot Wakanda Park Mounds dot HTM, HTML or Memony hyphen WI for Wisconsin dot gov. Now, in doing this research, so I was I was looking and they, they have this um historical marker this uh whatever this is this sign is like historical marker here at um the wakanda park in wisconsin and it it, it talks about a group of ancient mortuary uh group of ancient mortuary mound and it talks about prehistoric indian mound and they talk about these early mound builders. So this is this is a deep history. Okay, so uh, so these are just a just a few of the things we deal with. We talk about the Carthage and um, Hannibal Barca and the the Battle of Cannae in 216 BC and uh, Carthage being destroyed in 146 BC by the Romans. We deal with Ghana, Songhai, and Mali, those three great West African nations. We talk about the Moors um, as well. And everything we taught Europeans came back to kick us in the behind. We deal with, um, uh, according to the Oxford English Dictionary, the Moors as early as the Middle Ages and as late as the 17th century were commonly supposed to be black or very swarthy. And hence the word is often used for negro. Early in the 8th century, after a grim and extended resistance to the Arab invasions of North Africa, the Moors joined the triumphant surge of Islam. Following this, they crossed over from Morocco over to the Iberian Peninsula, which is today known as Spain and Portugal, where their swift victories and remarkable feats soon became the substance of legends. In 710 AD, or common era, Tarif, with 400 soldiers and 100 horses, all Berbers, successfully carried out a mission in southern Iberia. Tarif, an important port city in southern Spain, is named after him. This was a reconnaissance, reconnaissance mission to get the lay of the land and see what they were up against. It is clear, however, that the conquest of Spain was undertaken by Tariq ibn Ziyad. Tariq was in command of an army of at least 10,000 men. And where they land when they go in in 711 AD 
it's a rock prom uh, promontory called Jebel Tariq or Tariq's Mountain, also known as Gibraltar or the Rock of Gibraltar. And this is named after Tariq ibn Ziyad. So we go we go through and we go through and we look at everything from Christopher Columbus, Christopher Cologne to uh um Publius Cornelius Scipio Africanus, who uh is attacking Carthage. Uh, we look at uh uh what Columbus is is central to really understanding the spread of the transatlantic slave trade and where he went on his four voyages. And the, the nations that he conquered, the, the island nations that he conquered, like with like Jamaica and Dominican Republic and, and Haiti on the island of Hispaniola, which he called um, uh, La Isla, uh, La Isla Española, which is anglicized the Hispaniola, okay, refers to the Spanish island. So the western third of the island of Hispaniola is was a colony they called Santo Domingo amongst the Spanish. When when the French take it over, take over the colony in 1697 from the Spanish, they call it Saint Dominique. And we know there's a revolution in 1791 in 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 that colony. And when those Africans declared their independence January 1st, 1804, they called it Aiti, which is um, the Taino name, Aiti, and we call it Haiti. But those nations of Haiti, Santa Domi uh, um, Dominican Republic, Cuba, which Columbus conquers on behalf of the Spanish crown in 1492, Puerto Rico, which he conquers in 1493 on behalf of the Spanish crown, those island nations have never recovered for what happened to them over 500 years ago. They're still dealing with the side effects of what happened to them over 500 years ago. And the British take over Jamaica from the Spanish. The French take it over from the Spanish. But when we look at where Columbus goes on his four voyages, see Columbus helped lay the foundation for slavery, racism, capitalism, the exploitation of indigenous people. And then uh, we see that um, we're gonna have the Asiento de Negros signed by King Charles V in 1518, which really expands the transatlantic slave trade and, and causes direct uh transports of africans from africa directly to the spanish colonies without having to go into spain first the Asi the asiento de negros so we go through and look at a timeline of history we deal with things like what are papal bulls um we do a what uh, what was the transatlantic slave trade, the forced voyage of African people from Europe to Africa to the Americas. 1488, Pope Innocent VIII, he wasn't so innocent. Pope Innocent VIII accepted a gift of 100 more slaves from King Ferdinand of Spain and then distributed these African slaves to various cardinals and nobles. 1488. This is two years before Columbus set sail. Columbus set sail August 3rd, 1492, late in the same year that the Reconquista is complete and uh, the, the Spain takes back control of uh, the last stronghold of the Moors in Granada, January 2nd, 1492. Uh, when we look at, let me see here. What was the Middle Passage? So the Middle Passage was the leg of the triangular trade from Africa to the Americas, or what Europeans call the New World. 
manufactured products such as rum and textiles were or, or weapons and gunpowder, et cetera, were taken from Europe to Africa in exchange for Africans who would become uh, slaves or exchange for gold and silver. These Africans were then sold in the Americas, in the Caribbean for raw materials such as sugar and molasses. And one of the things that, that they're doing, especially amongst the Spanish and the French do this also, they set up sugarcane plantations in these colonies because sugarcane grows in warmer climates. So Jamaica and Haiti and Cuba and Puerto Rico are excellent climates to grow sugarcane. And sugarcane was a big commodity even before cotton became king. So we take you th throughout history. Uh, and then we uh, leave off in about the 1830s or so, 1840s. In the second class that I teach, um, from the Civil War to the Civil War, Black Power, 1865 to 1968, that second class basically picks up where this first class leaves off. And the reason why is because the, the second class is, is, is a 10 week online class. There's so much information that I, that I had that um, I couldn't deal with. See that the period of time from 1865 to 1968 is a crucial, crucial period of time. And we're dealing with the Civil War. We're dealing with the um, uh, special field order number 15, 40 acres and a mule, all, all this history. Okay. So uh, the second class uh, from the Civil War to the Civil Rights Movement and Black Power, 1865 to 1968. We go through in each class, we analyze about a 10, 15, 20 year period of time. We start in 1803 with the Louisiana Purchase, which is tied to the Haitian Revolution of 1791. And France sells the land that they have here in the US. They sell that land for about $15 million to the US in 1803. And that was that, that deal was signed off on by um, uh, Thomas Jefferson, President Thomas Jefferson. Um, so the Louisiana purchase basically doubles the territory of the U S at that time. And they're going to carve out, uh, about 15 States out of this territory, Louisiana purchase of 1803, which is tied to the Haitian revolution. And the Louisiana purchase of 1803 brought into the United States about 828,000 square miles of territory from France. France had no right to the land. This land basically stolen from Native Americans and African people who were already here. But this doubled the size of the U.S. What was known at the time as the Louisiana Territory stretched from the Mississippi River in the east to the Rocky Mountains in the west and from the Gulf of Mexico in the south to the Canadian border up north. Part or all of 15 states were eventually created from the land deal, which is considered one of the most important achievements of Thomas Jefferson's presidency. You check out history.com official website of the history channel. They have some good information there on the Louisiana purchase. So we go through and look at this history. We look at the, the, um, we look at this history chronologically as well. We look at Texas becoming part of the union, 1845. We look at Texas when it, their independence from, uh, Mexico in 1836. Mexico won their independence from Spain, 1821. Vicente Guerrero becoming the second president of Mexico in 1829. He's, the, he, and he's of African descent. He abolishes slavery. We look at the Alamo, the fight uh, uh, over the Alamo, the fort, uh, 1836. Uh, we look at the uh, Mexican-American War, uh, 1846, 1848. Okay. And from because of the Mexican-American War, then the U.S., is going and, and and you're dealing with this uh, concept of manifest destiny as well. The U.S. is going to get the land that makes up uh, California, Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, Utah, and Nevada from Mexico, 
as a result of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo of 1848, which is what ends the Mexican-American War. And you're dealing with westward expansion and you're dealing with the United States basically want to take over the entire North American continent. You're dealing with territorial disputes. This is how the Mexican-American War starts. But because of the Mexican-American War, you're going to have what's called the, uh, and even before that, you have the uh, Missouri Compromise of 1820, which organizes the land that the U.S. gets from the Louisiana Purchase. But the Compromise of 1850 organizes the land that the U.S. gets from Mexico, and it comprises, the, the Compromise of 1850 comprises of five bills. The fifth bill that it comprises of is the Fugitive Slave Act of 1850, which intensifies the abolitionist movement and causes more runaway slaves to go into Canada as opposed to staying in the North. And this is four years before the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854. And as a result of the Kansas-Nebraska Act of 1854, you have the Republican Party founded in 1854. Because the majority of the time that slavery exists in this country, you don't have a Democratic Party or Republican Party. Democratic Party is not founded in 1828. Republican Party is founded in 1854. So we're going to go through and see what leads to the Civil War taking place. Okay. And that's triggered, especially by the election, the uh, November 6, 1860 presidential election. And Abraham Lincoln becomes the um, president-elect and the uh, many Southern states fear that Lincoln's gonna free the slaves. So the first state to secede from the Union is South Carolina, December 20th, 1860, about six weeks after Lincoln becomes president-elect. The Civil War in the United States began in 1861, April 12, 1861, with the attack on Fort Sumter in South Carolina. After decades of simmering tensions between northern and southern states over slavery, states' rights, and westward expansion, the election of Abraham Lincoln, November 6, 1860, when he became president-elect, caused seven southern states to secede from the Union and form the Confederate States of America. Four more states soon joined. The war between the states as a civil war was also known ended in Confederate surrender in 1865. The conflict was the costliest and deadliest war ever fought on American soil with some 620,000 of 2.4 million soldiers killed, millions more injured, and much of the South left in ruin. And then we have to, we deal with reconstruction which is a crucial period of history, which is not really taught in schools. Reconstruction, 1865 to 1877, where African-Americans were showing America really how to have a democracy. There's a, um, there's a good article from time.com that we've talked about here on this show. Came out January of 2022, January 12, 2022. This makes the connection that, that, that I've been making even before I saw this article, this makes the connection between the political violence targeting African-Americans and white Republicans during the Reconstruction era. It makes the connection between that and the January 6, 2021 insurrection instigated by the traitor in chief, Donald Trump. A new report finds that 45 states are failing to teach students about the period that shaped race relations after the Civil War. That's the Reconstruction era. A new report finds that 45 states out of 50 are failing to teach students about the period that shaped race relations after the Civil War. We're still dealing with the effects of the Civil War and Reconstruction, Reconstruction ended in 1877. We're still dealing with those effects today. In the aftermath of the insurrection, January, uh, January 6, 2021, at the U.S. Capitol, many leading historians 
drew parallels between the violence and the reconstruction era the the period of political revolution directly following the american civil war quote the events we saw reminded me very much of the reconstruction era and the overthrow of reconstruction in 1877 which was often accompanied or accomplished i should say by violent assaults on elected officials which is why you needed the ku klux klan act of 1871. this is a quote from eric fauna pulitzer prize winning historian and author of reconstruction america's unfinished revolution 1863 to 1877. he said this in an interview with the new yorker published a week after the january 6 insurrection this is what i've been saying on the show i said dude that's it that's what that's what happened during reconstruction clinton mississippi massacre 1874 vicksburg mississippi uh massacre when you go study these riots and massacres during uh reconstruction but then after reconstruction ends a lot of that was over uh a lot of the, that, that was dealing with politics and trying to keep us from voting. Opelousa massacre, Opelousa, Louisiana, 1868. This is before Wilmington, North Carolina, 1898, where they overthrew a biracial uh, government in Wilmington, North Carolina. This was long before that. Scholars say studying the aftermath of the Civil War can help put in context many of the most seminal events in the U.S. in recent years, from the brutal murder of George Floyd uh, by police in uh, uh, May 25th, 2020, in uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota, to the voter suppression laws enacted after African-American voters played a big role in helping Joe Biden and Kamala Harris become president and vice president in 2020. But despite the timeliness of the era in today's climate, many students in American schools will not get a full education of Reconstruction until they get to college. Well, most of them are not going to college. And this is directly related to our understanding of history and your understanding of history influences your understanding of politics and who you vote for in the in the policies you support in social studies standards 45 out of 50 states and the district of columbia discussion of reconstruction is partial or non-existent in 45 states out of 50 and the district of columbia discussion on reconstruction 1865 to 1877 is partial or non-existent according to historians who reviewed the period it, it reviewed how the period is discussed in k-12 through social study standards for public schools nationwide in a report produced by the education nonprofit zen education project the study's authors say they are concerned that American children will grow up to be uninformed about the critical period of history that helps explain why full racial equality remains unfulfilled today. So all this is connected and all this is tied to history. And historical events don't happen in a vacuum. They are the, they are the culmination of a sequence of historical events that have a domino effect and lead to a larger event taking place. Okay, so check this out from time.com. A new report finds that 45 states are failing to teach students about the period that shaped race relations after the Civil War. All right, how's everybody doing? How y'all like this type of information? So uh, I teach the classes on the weekends, Saturday, uh, Saturdays and Sundays, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. If you have any questions, email me at ahnshow at africanhistorynetwork.com. 
we're gonna post the link here again you can register for the online class you also can register for the bundle pack um so the class is regularly 130 dollars they're on sale 60 dollars uh 60 dollars each we have the bundle pack you can register for both classes for 100 dollars if you want to pay through cash app email me and we can do that uh as well uh or you can just send it through cash app also i'll enroll you in the class we have a cash app information here um dollar sign the ahn show through cash app and through paypal paypal.me forward slash the ahn show so on saturdays uh we have the information at our website africanhistorynetwork.com on saturdays 2 p.m to 4 p.m eastern standard time ancient kemet the moors and the maafa understanding the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach you in school as soon as you register you can watch um the class we did last week so we do the sessions live all the sessions are archived they're recorded you can go back and watch them anytime okay you don't have to be present in class uh, and even a year and once you register you have full access to the class so even after the course is over with a year from now if you want to uh, watch the full classes there you can watch it you can also use this information with your children and your family the the, the information uh i would say it's pg-13 i don't do a lot of cursing it's not overly graphic i don't show naked people and things like this it is um it's not like that on saturday on sundays 2 p.m to 4 p.m i teach from the civil war to the civil rights movement in black power 1865 to 1968 okay all right and then all of my dvd lectures and digital downloads are at our website africanhistorynetwork.com if you have any questions email me if you want me to do presentation or you want me teaching these classes for your churches your study groups organizations fraternity sororities you want me to do a modified uh a shorter version of these classes or you want me to do a presentation uh for your group organization email me as well okay well look we have to get out of here um i'll see you all in class uh, remember at the african history network uh, hopefully you learned a lot from this give us a thumbs up on this broadcast give us a heart give us a like Follow us on our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P. And uh, turn on live notifications so you know when we go live. Also, sign up for our email newsletter. Text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, the 22828. Text the word Kemet, uh, the, uh, the word Kemet to uh, 22828 to sign up for our email newsletter. All right, look, we have to get out of here. Uh, remember, at the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world. Uh, I'll be on Roland Martin Unfiltered on Friday. I'm a panelist usually on Fridays. And, um, you know, on Sundays, uh, we're here for two hours uh, on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation WFDF, the African History Network show. You know, we're here for two hours on Sundays. All right, remember, right now is correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. We're kind of forever. And we'll talk to you next time and we'll see you in class. Peace.